Yeah, Australians love Hokkaido. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, they all parts of it. Yeah. Mm, the but, snow there is supposed to be amazing. In yeah, it is. Yeah. This I was in Nagano. Yeah. I have a friend, all. I think my friend's place is in Nagano, not Hokkaido. Okay. Um, but he says there's no problem with snow there at all. It's uh, terrific. Oh. Our oh, Valentin's on the call. Hey, Valentin. We lost him. Hello, there guys. He Hi, how are you doing? Good evening. Good on you. Thanks for joining us. Where are you? Are you in Shanghai? My pleasure. Right now, I am in Xiamen. Oh, okay. Yeah. You pronounced it perfectly. So, obviously, that's where you're based. No, no, I'm based in Shanghai. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Just here for for some events. Yeah. Oh, I no. See. Th thank you for hosting oh, ten hours tonight. I appreciate you taking your Friday night to lead us through, uh, lead us through the wines. Uh, it's uh, very kind of you and uh, Adriana to let us have a look at these in the sample form. Um, maybe if you can kick off just with a general sketch. I mean, most of the people in the in the room um, have a good idea. These are all existing clients of Catina Zapata, but. Um, maybe just give us a general sketch of how the winery sits in the South American scene, and um, and then we'll look at these two wines. Okay, perfect. Shall I? Is it okay if I share the? Um... Please. Okay, I think you need to enable. I me. need to. Yeah, multiple people. There you go. It's been such a long time since I've uh, run this. Is it? Is it sharing? Yeah. There we go. There we go. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. One sec. Okay. So you can all see the screen, right? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so Catena Zapata, uh, we are talking about Mendoza, Argentina. Okay. Um, Argentina has 23 provinces uh in total in the country, and 17 are already producing wine. So we have a lot more than Mendoza, but still Mendoza accounts for 20 for 80 percent of the wine uh, produced in Argentina. So it's a still uh, the most important uh, wine making region uh, in, in Argentina. And of course, Malbec uh, stands at the at the top, one of the most uh, produced grapes in Argentina. Uh, but we are seeing very new, exciting projects, uh, say, we have a place uh, very close to our capital city, to Buenos Aires, that is uh, next to the sea. It's similar to maybe to Rias Baixas in Spain. And we are producing very high quality whites there as well, like Alvarino, like Sauvignon Blanc. Um, in the south, in Patagonia, we are producing some very, there are some very exciting um, Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays that are from very cool weather in Patagonia. So um, Argentina is uh is a very exciting place to to go and to taste uh, different things nowadays um but for catena zapata of course um yeah. the, the main uh the main thing the main uh production everything comes from mendoza despite we are uh, playing around with different vineyards uh in in new areas okay um this is something that we are very excited uh, and we I wanted to share with you because this year for us is a, a, a year of celebration. Uh, we were chosen uh, the world's uh, best vineyard in July, um, first one in the list. So we are very, very, very proud to have an Argentinian winery and for us to be to be taking this, to, to have been chosen the, the world's best vineyard. Uh, in the picture, you might see this lady wearing the, the red uh, boina, that's how we call it in Argentina. Uh, she's the fourth generation of the Catena Zapata family, uh, Laura Catena, and she is the current uh, person uh, leading the winery. Okay. Uh, the story of Catena Zapata winery is the same as most Argentinian wineries. So our winemaking culture comes from the European immigrants uh, that arrived to Argentina uh, actually a long time ago. Argentina, even though it's a new, it's a it's a new world winemaking country, but within the new world, we are a very old um, country in terms of wine production because um, we got the since like a Spanish uh, arrived to to South America in like 500, 600 years ago. Um, they brought the winemaking culture, so we find uh, we find a lot of like old vines and evidence that they started producing wine in Argentina 
um, like around that time, like 500 years ago. Um, but then the big influx and the the per, the, the the pursuit for higher quality started uh, with the with the immigrants that arrived a hundred around a hundred fifty years ago from Europe. Um, and Catena Zapata family uh, is the same story. Basically, you see four people here on the on the right. Uh, this is the the family, the four generations that have led the winery. Um, it was Nicola Catena that emigrated from Italy from Le Marche. Uh, to Argentina, uh, looking for better opportunities for him. He arrived with 18 years old, um, and then he heard about this place called Mendoza that was really suitable for, for to produce wine. So he started producing wine in 1902, so 121 years ago in Mendoza in Argentina. Um, and now it's the, the third and fourth generation in charge of the winery, which are the two people that we see here on the at the at the at the lower bottom okay so nicolas catena zapata and laura catena uh his daughter um and really like catena zapata is normally referred as the pioneer in terms of uh wine making not only for catena but for argentina um with a lot of different changes uh that we did um Nicolás Catena Zapata in the 80s uh, was uh, an invited scholar in berkeley university in california and then at that time, it was the time of the judgment of Paris. The Napa wines were getting great scores right next to the best French wines. So Nicolas was at California at that time, and he, he met people like Mondavi. Uh, and then he thought, OK, if they can do it in the US, that it's also a new world winemaking country, um, why not me in Argentina? So he he did the first changes he did after that trip to to the U.S. was change the winemaking in that we were doing in the winery because before uh, Argentinian wine was still producing in those like old a little bit oxidized uh, methods uh, that they learned from 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 the Italians um, and then. Uh, say, for example, stainless steel tanks, like uh, closed uh, oak barrels were non-existent back then. Um, so then Nicolas saw that uh, that those wines that were trying to focus more on the on, on conserve, preserving the fruitness, the freshness of the wines uh, in Napa. And then he applied that in, in, in the winery. So he bought like a stainless steel tanks and already changed a lot, the, started changing the, the style of the wines. Uh, but then, uh, like around, that was in the 80s. In the 90s, there was a day that he was tasting uh, Catena wines with Pierre uh, Lourton. Sorry, my French is horrible, but a very famous uh, winemaker from, from France. Um, and then uh, this, this person told Nicolas, Nicolas, your wines are great. They remind me of the wines from the Languedoc, the south of France. And then when Nicolas heard this, he was like very upset because Nicolas said that his goal was to produce wines um, equally at the level of the top French wines or Napa wines like Bordeaux, Burgundy. That was his his goal. So then Nicolas thought, OK, like Languedoc is a very warm region. Um, is it that I can find some cooler areas in Mendoza to produce higher quality of, of Argentinian wine? And then that's when he decided to go to high altitude. So in, in Mendoza, we are very close to the Andes, to the Andes mountain. That is the, the, the you have a picture here in the middle, like that's that's basically the Andes is, we can see this everywhere from Mendoza. Um, and then, so it was the first winery that dared to plant at uh, more than a thousand meters above sea level. Uh, actually today, the the wines we are gonna, we are gonna taste like a big part uh, is coming from the Adriana vineyard. Uh, which is the first vineyard that he planted at 1,450 meters above sea level. Um, and then nowadays, like, we are the winery that got the most amount of 100-point wines in South America, and all of them are coming from this vineyard. But at that time, people were telling Nicolás, like, Nicolás, your grapes are not going to ripen there because it's too cold. Uh, but it's just that high altitude in Mendoza is the perfect mix of like cooler climate, especially the evenings, the temperature really goes down. So it can give like a beautiful natural acidity and freshness to the wine. But also Mendoza is, uh, we get like this picture that you see there with the blue sky, that's every day in Mendoza. We get blue sky every day. It's it's very, we it, it rains very little, it's very dry, uh, it's not cloudy at all. So then the sunlight intensity in high altitude is very important. 
to to reach that perfect level that that perfect like balance of good ripeness because of the sun um and also the cool climate uh natural acidity so anyways uh, that was more or less what Nicolas did that really changed the way Argentinian wineries were producing wine. Um, and the third revolution came with his daughter, Laura Catena. Um, she's actually, her background is not winemaking. She she studied, uh, she's a biologist and a doctor, graduated from Stanford and Harvard University. Um, and then she she just loved to study. And when she when she started helping in the winery, she usually talked to her to her grandpa to, to her grandpa to Nicolas dad. And then her grandpa used to tell her, Laura, you can make great wines in Argentina, especially Malbec. He was a huge believer in in Malbec. Um, but we cannot make wines uh, as good as the French because the French have terroir, and we don't have terroir in Argentina. And Laura always thought this kind of like she was not very convinced about her what her grandpa told her because Laura said you taste different wines from different regions in Mendoza and they do taste different even the same grape variety even Malbec from different sub regions different altitudes can taste different so Laura really started uh trying to understand better um the terroir we had in the winery and then she founded the Catena Institute of Wine uh with the principle of using science to preserve nature. She believes that, um, especially with the weather, with the, with the climate change, uh, all the wineries in the world should really have their research center to really understand uh, what's going on and how, because how, I mean, Catena's goal is to keep on elevating wines for the next, keep on elevating Argentinian wine for the next 100 to 200 years, at least. So then she said like, I need to take care of my environment if I want to do that. So that's how she did a lot of research. And the wines we will taste today are also coming out of our result of this research. So now the Catena family has six vineyards in Mendoza. Okay, this is a Mendoza map. Okay, so our oldest vineyard is a vineyard planted around 1922. So almost a hundred years old vineyard. Um, no, already a hundred years old vineyard. Uh, and, uh, and then... As we go closer to the Andes, that in this picture will be going to the to the west, uh, it'll be going a, 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 like closer to the Andes mountain. Um, and here we have our younger vineyards, but that are producing like very, very high quality wines. This the, the first vineyard in high altitude was planted in 1992, the Adriana Vineyard. Um, and we have some other vineyards that were planted uh, later on. Um, why Argentina? Why I speak about high altitude and almost every Argentinian winery is talking about high altitude nowadays is because in, in Mendoza, um, a different, you can basically, so this will help me explain it. This is the Winkler classification, right? That this is a classification that uh, classifies uh, different uh, winemaking regions around the world according according to their uh, climate, right? So we see the region one will be what is considered the coldest, that as a reference you see on the right, Burgundy and Champagne. And then if we go warmer to regions four and even five, it'll be something like Chateauneuf de Pape, a little bit warmer, more, more, more warm, but, but a little bit more, a little bit cooler will be like Barossa, like Napa. And then in Mendoza, the, the thing is like, uh, we can go from somewhere region classified as region one to somewhere classified as region four or five in less than half an hour driving because of the high altitude um, uh, influence in the in the climate, okay? Say for example, the today we are gonna taste the Adriana vineyard, the, the, the last wine, the Malbec is from the, from the Mundus Basilus Terrae, um, and the Adriana vineyard is a vineyard, is the first vineyard that Catena family planted in high altitude. And it can be classified depending on the vintage as a region one. So as cold as Burgundy or Champagne or as a region two, similar to Bordeaux, Barolo. So, so it's, it's really important to, I mean, high altitude in Mendoza can really make a difference for the wines. Yeah. This is, uh, that's a little bit about the background. If you have any questions or comments, um, otherwise I can talk a little bit about the the, the wines. Yeah, let's let, let's have a look at the Nicola now. 
Okay. So Nicolas Catena Zapata, uh, you already, I hope you already know why, why this wine has this name. So Nicolas Catena Zapata, third generation of the Catena Zapata family. Um, this wine uh, is the, 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 the concept of this wine, the philosophy is the original Bordeaux blend. Okay. And we say it's original Bordeaux blend because of two reasons. First, you might have seen already in the, in the tubes case that you have the great varieties that it has. So it has Cabernet Sauvignon, it has Malbec, it has Cabernet Franc, okay? So there is a lot of evidence actually that in the like 200 years ago, ago in Bordeaux, in the Medoc area, um, Malbec was a very important grape variety because many people think, oh, Malbec was a, is a, even though it's a French grape, uh, it didn't do well in France and it did very well in Argentina, but actually Malbec had a very successful past in France, even in the 1855 uh, Bordeaux classification. Um, there was there is a lot of evidence that most of the wines had Cabernet Sauvignon and Malbec. Even the Cheval Blanc, uh, 1855, had up to 60% of Malbec in the blend. Mm -hmm. So it used to do very well. It was only that after, because of Phylloxera and also because really Bordeaux weather doesn't I think we've just lost Valentin. I must blame uh, Chinese technology. <laughs> God. Are you back? Valentin, I think we've lost your video. VPN restart. Yeah. Let me message him. Yeah. Guys, while we're waiting for Valentine to come back in, um, one of the things that makes this 2020 quite unique is the fact that it contains more Cabernet Franc than any other uh, vintage before. Hopefully, when Valentin comes back, he can corroborate that for me. I discovered that information while I was doing the research today. He's back. You're back? Bravo. Valentin, maybe there's not enough bandwidth where you are to sustain the, the, the share screen. I'm going to keep talking while, while he reboots in. So um, the blend mix of, the, of this particular release is 54% Cabernet, 25% Franc, and the rest Malbec. Um, and a lot has been written about the uh, increased dominance of, of Franc in this particular blend. It's certainly Cabernet Franc as a style is definitely something that um, I look for everywhere, having been brought up on a lot of it in South Africa. Um, it's a favorite varietal of mine. Um, the other thing that I'm getting quite a lot of influence on, uh, Valentin, maybe you wanna um, enable your video first. Your video is, um, is not enabled. There you go. N now try the share screen. Robert, maybe he can send you the, the presentation yeah. and you can share screen on your yeah. end. I think he's um, no, my friend's no, no, no. working. So maybe you can send it to me, and I'll um, 
and I'll open it in my side vanity. Or we just let or we just carry on with the with the tasting of the wines. Hello. All right, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep going. I think the thing that strikes me the most is a sense of fragrance and perfume about this this 2020. There's also um, uh, a lot of wet minerality um, about the varietal itself, about the wine, the way it's presenting tonight. And it also seems a fair bit more restrained. I remember in, uh, looking at the 18 and 19s when those releases first came out, um, they were way more uh, overt and, and forward. One of the questions I had written down to ask Valentin was how he thought um, about the sugar levels and the alcohol levels of this 20 in comparison to the previous vintages, because it just seems a little more restrained. And it's, I guess, something that um, I'm quite fond of, is that, is that level of restraint in the wine. I'm getting some good um, sediment at the bottom of mine. It's always good. I'm going to look at the Adriana. Who's coming? <laughs> Is he back? Hi, Valentin. Why don't we just run it like this rather than using the presentation? Is that the thing that's causing a problem? I'm with my phone. Sorry, guys. Yeah, the the Wi-Fi is not is not working. Okay, yeah. no problem. Okay, so what you I'm were saying... you were tasting you were tasting the wines. Um, let's go straight to the tasting. Sure. Uh, so basically, um, original uh original Bordeaux blend. Okay, so this for the Nicolas. Um, it's a blend of um a Cabernet. You can see the grape varieties this year in the there. It's like fifty four percent Cabernet Sauvignon with some. 25% Cabernet Franc, 21% Malbec. So um, since 2017, 100% um, of this wine is all coming from high altitude vineyards. So we have the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Malbec, and a part of the Malbec is coming from the Adriana vineyard, so 1,500 meters above sea level. And then we have another part of the Malbec with the Cabernet Franc coming from the very south of Mendoza, from the Nicasia vineyard at 1,100 meters above sea level. Um, the winemaking, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a winemaking that, because we have a partnership with the Lafitte family in Mendoza, uh, for another winery that is called Bodega Caro. Um, and then the winemaking for this wine is actually a method that we learned from them at, at Lafitte. Um, so basically we vinify separated, uh, each grape variety. Um, we even age six months, uh, each variety separated, and then we choose the blend. Um, and then we, after it's blended, we uh, keep aging for another 12 months of uh, in oak before it goes uh, to the bottle. Okay. There was a note that I picked up, uh, Valentin, somewhere about the um, components of Franck in this particular vintage being historically high, higher than any percentage in previous vintages. Is that correct? Yes, um, correct. Because yeah. I'm getting masses of... Um, fragrance and perfume from the franc and of course it's adding great color to the wine as well totally totally yeah the so what the cap franc from from this area does is that is as you said robert like it enhances a lot the the the, the aromatics of the wine um and also we have it has a very a very nice acidity as well mm. 2020 was a relate was a very mendoza mendozinian year in terms that it was quite a relatively warm and very dry vintage so then um this cup franc also helps to enhance the acidity of mm. the wine and that's why that's why it, it, the, the cup franc percentage is a little bit higher uh than other vintages there seems to be more restraint and calm about the wine at this early stage relative to 19. Um, I, I'm finding it softer, more approachable. I'm wondering if that's not some of the Cabernet Franc influence coming through as well um, in, in this early sort of exhibition of the, of the wine. Yeah, also the 19 uh, has a little bit less Cap Sauvignon ah, as well. Okay. 
So this one also, like here, you get also a lot of cap, uh, like Cabernet Sauvignon nose as mm. well. Uh, mm. like it's yeah, it's very the 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 nineteen was a was also quite a cooler vintage. Uh, we then had had some frost that year. So then the the wine is if you taste the two of them together, it feels mm. like they're two. It might be two different wines. Yes. The nineteen really yeah. goes on the floral note on the 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 red fruits. Uh, yeah. with a with a lot of freshness this one to me feels more of a typical like uh bordeaux yes. bio. Yeah, yeah 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 no super interesting all right let's uh let's move over to the adriana the 100 percent malbec now if we can okay yes so adriana is a adriana vineyard that first vineyard that we planted at high altitude uh we started this vineyard we started making wine out of this vineyard in 2004 um, but also, so at the beginning, this this whole vineyard was producing a wine called Adriana Vineyard Mal Malbec. So, but even then, um, we had we always knew that this parcel, the Adriana uh, Mundus Facilus Terrae parcel, uh, was really producing a very distinguishing type of Malbec. Uh, so we did a lot of research uh, in this specific parcel. We did uh, seventy. Uh, it's a parcel of one point four hectares. And we did 70 holes in order to, to see what was going on in this in this in this parcel. And then we identified a type of bacteria um, that actually is a bacteria that is called rhizobacteria. Um, that is a bacteria that basically helps the vine to deal with stress and to absorb nutri nut nutrients uh, from the soil. And basically, this parcel was particularly rich in this type of bacteria. Uh, compared to other places in Adriana Vineyard. We still don't know exactly what is the relationship between the bacteria and the flavor profile of the wine, because it does taste different compared to other Adriana Vineyard Malbecs in other in other parcels. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are still studying that. Um and and I mean when you taste this wine, it just it just tastes uh very, very very special you get i mean the the nose the, the color first of all the color the color is really the high altitude uh malbec that yeah. has those kind of like very intense colors the nose and but the mouth of this wine is and it's a wine that normally is quite shy i don't know how i opened last night i had a tasting with an with a 20 and mm -hmm. and it took some time to open up yeah, it's um it, it's straight straight out of the out of the blocks for me. Um, it's it's at the right temperature as well. I had them in the wine fridge until just before seven o'clock. So the Nicholas was a little bit shy in the beginning, but this uh, the Adriana is at the same temperature now, and it's it's awesome. I think what's so remarkable about it is this opulence, this kind of just undulating opulence, but the acids are still keep it all together. So often with Malbec. You get that uber richness, but it has a flabbiness about it. And what Adriana is so distinctive, um, and in fact, all of Zapata's wines in the structure of the Malbec is is so perfectly done. Um, the acids are so great um, that you never get that feeling of overabundance in the wine. We've lost him again. I thought he just didn't like my opinion. <laughs> you know the alcohol content in the Malbec. What's yeah. that? Do you know the alcohol content in the Adriana? No, um, I, I would, I would, I'd be scared to make a call on that, mate, because it's so well balanced. It's very hard to actually pick. You know, often when a wine is this balanced, it could be, it could be thirteen, it could be, it could be fifteen. Although I think it's, I think it's closer to thirteen than fifteen. Um, I think it's, it's incredibly well uh, constructed. It just blows me away the the altitude components of this wine, you know, in, in Spain, in Madrid, they get very excited about 1100 meters. And here we're tasting 1450 meters. That's uh, that's snow country. It's really amazing. I guess it's a whole different con walk from a winemaking point of view as deciding when to call to take that fruit off the vine must be so difficult. Uh, it must be a, a very specific art because you want the ripeness. Um, but um, as that somebody pointed out, to Nicholas back in the day, how do you get it? How do you get it ripe enough when it's that cold? So it must be a, a hell of a juggling match. Uh, a, a, a great credit to the viticulturist and and to the, and to Lara, the winemaker, to pull that off. It's really impressive. Is Argentina is the only country, or or was Chile 
have the have the variety at a so high attitude? Uh, mate, I, I would. I, I think Chile has as well. Um, uh, I'd be surprised if they didn't. Um, but it seems to me that Argentina's um, kind of created its its fame on on high altitude Malbec, and I, I think it's probably fair to say that um, the uh, Cantina Zapata was the first to recognise that extreme, the success of the extremely high um, altitude. I mean, the fact that they're growing grapes in literally in the Andes. Is, Still quite uh, defy. Uh, just I have a hard time, but coming to terms with, with with that as a concept, it's amazing. I can't wait one day, hopefully, to get there and actually look at it for myself. How, how is the South Africa? Is, is there any high altitude of vineyard in the um, South? Africa? Yeah, the highest altitude in Stellenbosch, which is I guess the main Cabernet producer in South Africa, um, is not very high. I think it's um, seven hundred meters. That's the absolute highest plot. Um, the Stork Condé Cabernet. Um, Swartland, I um, wouldn't make Cabernet. Uh, it's, it's much hotter and flatter. Um, and I, I do know now that they're growing quite good Syrah and Pinotage in the Karoo, which is inland and relatively high altitude. It's not mountainous by, by any means, but um, it's certainly seven or 800 meters above sea level, maybe even more. Freezing cold winters, I remember as a kid trying to survive the Karoo winters. It wasn't, wasn't a lot of fun. Um, so no, it's not it's not a specialist country for high altitude. It's, I, I guess its fame was built on a Mediterranean style climate. I often say to people, you can draw a parallel to um, Margaret River in terms of the Stellenbosch, uh, Franschhoek esque um, uh, conditions uh, of terroir. Interesting. Hey, I see the first slides. If you remember that uh, they they. Um... Uh, Valentin says there are three revolutions. The first one is changing the barrel from oak to stainless, right? Yeah. So now they are all like uh, aging or, or from in the, in the stainless uh, barrel. No, there's definitely oak influence in these wines, but um, they matured in steel first. So um, I think what he was pointing out there was there was a, a fair degree of um, oxidation and clumsiness about the wine. Welcome back. <laughs> oh my God. What's going on, China? <laughs> Don't worry. It's not nearly as bad as talking to South African uh, winemakers um, on Zoom calls. I remember we had Ibn Saidi a couple of uh, months ago. He was in his truck in the middle of a rainstorm, and that's the best he could oh give God. us. <laughs> Sorry, I just I just heard that someone was asking for the for the alcohol level in the moon. Yes, yes. It is, it is 14. Uh, and the Nicolas is 13.9. Um, and then something interesting about the Mundus, because we were talking uh, about the freshness, the, the acidity yes. that you were mentioning, Robert, yes. is the winemaking. So 25% of the Mundus is vinified as a white wine. Oh. That means that the, 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 we take the, the, the grape skins out, um, and that is also to preserve the freshness, again, right. and the acidity. And also up to 50% is the whole cluster fermentation, right. um, which also enhances the freshness, uh, the freshness sensation of the mm -hmm. wine, uh, which is a technique that is normally used in Burgundy for Pinot Noir. And we found that in Malbec can really, can really yeah. help as well. Very interesting. I mean, it's, it's just, I, I'm not sure how much I, I, I was having a, a confidence crisis because your face froze while I was banging on about the wonderful acids and how it counteracts the richness of the wine. And I thought, oh God, maybe I've, I've said the wrong thing, but um, I think what sets Zapata apart from a lot of other South American Malbec is you have this uber richness, but brilliant acids. There's no sense of flabbiness or, or overabundance in the, in the wine, um, which is so remarkable. It's something I'm a big fan of with you guys. Yeah, it's it's and these the 2020 is is drinking very well now compared to other mundus yes. that normally yes. can be very tight. Yeah. Um, so you you open it and you still get a lot of the expression. Yeah. But this is a wine we tasted the first vintage of the mundus 2011 mm -hmm. and it's drinking beautifully now. Like it's really it, it it's a wine that can develop in to levels that we never thought Malbec could develop those We're kind of uh, tertiary notes notes. Oh. So. It's a wine that is meant to to be kept, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. It's yeah. a big problem. And also, 
what yeah. I love about this wine is how the aftertaste, like it's kind of like you get the fruitiness at the beginning, then you drink it, the acidity takes over, the tannins takes over. Uh, but then again, once you finish swallowing it, mm -hmm. uh, you, you get the, that uh, fruitiness back yeah. somehow. It's amazing. It is beautiful back palate. Really amazing. Um, there's a sense of gravitas about it without anything that's clumsy or overdone. Uh, guys, are there any more questions of Valentine before we burn up the rest of the China's the, the bandwidth in China? <laughs> totally crash everything. Somebody also, I heard somebody was asking about the high altitude thing. So yeah. what what we need to because in Argentina, if you go to the north to Salta, which is another very famous winemaking region, you get three, fourth bangers at three thousand meters above sea level which of course is higher than our 1,500 meters in Mendoza. Uh, but just, it's, it's always the mix of altitude and latitude that we need to that we need to take a look, that we need to take into account when we talk about altitude. It's not just altitude per se, right? Right, right. That's an interesting part. I've never thought about it in that context. It's not just about, about height. It's about where it's located as well. Yeah, very interesting. All right, well, Valentin, thank you for kicking off my weekend brilliantly. <laughs> it's a it's a long weekend of drinking as we get closer to Christmas. Thank uh, you, guys. Thank, no, you thank you so you, much for thank you for the time and everyone who joined the call. I appreciate you all being here. If I don't see you again before Christmas, I'll see you in the new year. So, ciao and good night. Cheers. Thank I can't miss it as in Mendoza. Ah, fantastic! I was I was hoping for an invite. We'll see you. Yeah. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.